Didn't see you there. Don't excuse my doodles. So, you want to learn about nuclear reactors, I hear. Yes, well, the key thing with is that a guy called Enrico Fermi found out that fission actually takes place more often if you slow the neutrons down. So using this, we'll get together some steel, a bit of concrete, not forgetting the enriched uranium, and bish bash bosh. Yes! Glad you made it to the other side. Now let's talk about fuel pins. They contain enriched uranium, which is just like your average everyday uranium, but with more uranium-235, which is what we need for fission. So what happens here with fission is a neutron comes in and hits the uranium-235 atom. This then causes three neutrons to be released, which then go on to hit more uranium-235 atoms and cause more neutron release. But the key thing is, every time this process takes place, energy is released. How did I end up down there? Let's talk about control rods. The control rods are used so that the reaction doesn't get out of hand. They are lowered automatically when there is a sudden increase in the number of neutrons detected by the sensors, as this could lead to a meltdown of biblical proportions. <laughs> They are often made of boron and cadmium, as these are ideal materials for absorbing neutrons. As such, they do a very good job in controlling the reaction, so that we get electricity and not a disaster. It all goes back to when Fermi realised that fission takes place more efficiently when the neutrons are slowed down, and this is where the moderator comes in. If we look here, the moderator should not absorb the neutrons, but rather scatter them, and this is shown by this inequality here that the chance of scattering is much, much greater than the chance of absorption. So what this means is that rather than losing neutrons, they just lose kinetic energy. And that means that they will slow down and fission will take place more efficiently. The ideal moderator would have the same mass as a neutron. So 100% of the kinetic energy would be lost and they wouldn't move at all. However, in practice, graphite or water is used as a compromise between effectiveness and availability. And that's how we moderate fission. We've cooled down now, so let's talk about the coolants. <laughs> The key thing about the coolant is it must flow easily, much like the water 
dripping off my face. And this also must not be corrosive, which is very likely, or my face would no longer be the beautiful thing it is at the moment. It must be in a sealed circuit and pumped from the core of, react of the reactor to the heat exchanger. This is because the coolant, when it passes through the core, is heated up by the nuclear fission that does take place. This the, the coolant then gets very hot and transfers the energy to the metal pipes that heats up the fluid inside that turns the turbines and creates the electricity. Another thing about the coolant atoms are that they do become radioactive when they pass through the core and this is one of the reasons we must seal the circuits so no radiation escapes and we can, can all remain cool under the collar. How did you get in there? Get out of there! Now let's talk about waste, and I'm not talking about the biology A level. <laughs> it's nuclear waste. The waste is due to spent fuel in the fuel cans. It is highly radioactive for a long time, as it's just been bombarded by neutrons for so long. It is also a beta emitter due to the fact that the products of fission are um, neutron rich. The spent fuel rods are removed by remote control with great care from the core. Now let's take a look at how they're treated. So they're treated in a way that is, a, that is very safe. They are first stored in containers in cooling ponds until they are cool, as that's it's obviously when they will be safer. And then the spent fuel is removed from the rods by remote control. And it is processed so that any unspent fuel is put back in and we are saving the environment. The unwanted material is then stored in sealed containers for many, many, many years as it is highly radioactive for very, very long and we need to wait until it is at an indistinct radioactive level. This is, again, much like a biology A level. It stays with you for a very long time and you just can't wait to get rid of it. Now, we have to talk about critical mass. Critical mass. Critical mass. The critical mass is the minimum mass capable of producing a self sustaining reaction. Here we have a block of enriched uranium which contains both atoms of uranium-235, in which fission does take place, and uranium-238, which doesn't fission at all. So what we have to look at are three possible scenarios when fission takes place. The resulting neutron could hit a, another uranium-235 atom, and more fission would take place, in which case it's happy days. However, the neutron could also hit a non-fissionable uranium-238 atom, and he, well, that's not very good. Or, the neutron may escape the block altogether and go freelance. And critical mass is to do with, if too many neutrons escape, the chain will die out, much like the dodo. Now, what we have to look at when discussing critical mass is the volume, as the volume is proportional the number of neutrons produced per unit time. So this means if the volume increases, then so will the number of neutrons. So, but then there is also another side to that, a darker side. If the surface area is also increased, then the number of neutrons lost per unit time 
will also increase. So, not only do we have to look at the volume when discussing critical mass, but the actual shape of the block itself. So, let's talk about surface area. So, as I discussed earlier, the chance of neutron loss is increased when the surface area increases. And here we have three shapes. We have the cube, the disc, and the sphere. The sphere is the best shape for a fuel block. This is because it has the minimum surface area for the same volume. So that means fewer neutrons will be lost and therefore the chain reaction can continue and we have electricity. The disc on the other hand is by far the worst shape as it has a maximum surface area for that volume and will lose the most neutrons. However, the cube is an average source of shape for a fuel block, as although you will lose some neutrons, it may not be the worst case scenario. And also with the cube, you have to look at when you increase the dimensions by two, the surface area will increase by a scale factor of four, but the volume will in fact increase by a scale factor of a whopping eight. And that means that although you will lose more neutrons per unit time, you will also have many more neutrons being produced. So each block of a different shape will have a minimum size where fission does not die out. And that is what we are looking for when we talk about critical mass. types of reactor. We shall first take a look at the thermal reactor, which is the oldest and the most common of nuclear reactors, and they have been the focus of our presentation thus far. They use enriched uranium and they need a moderator due to the neutrons being needed to slow down in order for the chance of fission to be increased. However, and they do differ within this category due to slight changes in the type of fuel, the power output, and the types of moderator, such as using water or graphite. However, I am going to let you in on a little secret. Not really the only type of reactor. Now, this other type of reactor is a bit like me. Over here. Wow. Now, first we have to make use of the uranium 238 for natural uranium. As in the thermal reactors, sometimes the uranium 238 will absorb a neutron. And then this creates uranium-239. And then this beta decays, as shown here, to create plutonium. As plutonium does, does not occur naturally, it is very valuable, especially seeing as it is fission, it is fissionable, and therefore it is used in fast reactors. And also, the key thing about plutonium is Unlike uranium-235, it is in fact fission better by fast neutrons and therefore these fast reactors do not need a moderator as they want the neutrons as fast as they can get, even faster than me. Now let us look at the internal workings of the fast reactor. Here we have the fuel rods with a plutonium-239 core and the control rods, yet again to make sure the reaction doesn't get out of control. 
Then we have the coolant, which specifically does not act as a moderator in order to keep the neutrons fast. But the way it is specifically interesting, the way in which we produce the plutonium. It is, as we've said before, a waste product in thermal reactors due to the absorption of neutrons by uranium-238. However, it is also in fast reactors that we see this renewal. We see this in the breeding grounds. These are in the form of the uranium-238 blankets. These absorb any spare neutrons flying off to either side. They then form uranium-239, which then, as earlier explained, through beta decay, forms plutonium-239, and therefore more fission takes place, and therefore we get more energy, and everything is happy, because 60% more of the uranium-238 is used in fast reactors, and that means this extends the lifetime of our uranium-238 reserves by centuries or more. Now I'm afraid our journey is drawing to a close. I hope you have enjoyed learning about the magic that is nuclear reactors. I hope you have fun and react nuclearly to your heart's content. Adieu.